When I sold real estate, I had a 94.6% closing rate ratio. When I sold real estate. The only way you left my office is if you died <laughs> without buying. Okay. Now, this is what it's all about. This separates the men from the boys and the girls from the gals. Or the women from the girls. This is the crux of what made the Great Western story possible. This is the crux of what the various other things that I've done in my life possible. This is something that I developed between 1976 and 1978. Just as I hope and wish and pray that today is a revelation for a lot of you. In 1976 I had the pleasure of attending a seminar put on by a very bright man named Jim Newman. Jim Newman's, some of his stable are uh, Dennis Waitley, Dreyer, to name a couple. Jim Newman is now semi-retired. He has a seminar called PACE, Personal and Company Effectiveness. And he is the man that is credited with the comfort zone. He, he, he invented, if you will, in the late 50s, early 60s, the comfort zone. Now, I'm going to give you an example of comfort. If I had $1,000 bills and we had a 2 by 12 here on the ground and I had $1,000 bills over there, I'm sure everybody in this room could walk back and forth on this 2 by 12 all day long and pick up these $1,000 bills. Is that probably true? Now we put the, the 2 by 12 50 stories up. Is there anybody that walked 50 stories up for $1,000 bills across the 2 by 12? Okay. Okay. I, I, I think I crawl. Yeah. Yeah, it's windy. It's windy up there. It's windy up there. Now, but a lot of you, the comfort changed. You're not as comfortable, right? Okay. Now, what if your child was over there? and your child was on fire. Somebody had just doused gasoline, you know. More of you would be able to get across that two by 12, you know. And see, I walk 50 stories up now. It's hard for me to think of being on the ground floor. I, can, I, can't, I can't think. Well, first of all, I don't want to think that way anymore. It's like when I was presented a year ago to the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, I was very comfortable. A, a couple years ago when I met President Bush, I was very comfortable. Uh, I am not daunted by business situations, by problems, by challenges. I feel very comfortable because I, have, I feel comfortable with it that I can accomplish and do almost anything. To me, yesterday's dreams are today's realities. I'm very, very much a believer, and these aren't new concepts. These are my words for my five credos, that what you think about the most is what you will be in the future. My mother used to tell me, you go to bed with dogs, you get up with fleas. Now that was her way of saying the same thing, uh, I think. Um, she was referring to some of the girls I dated in high school. But at the time, but she, she meant, she, I think she meant something else. But um, the, they become the realities. Seeing your dreams ahead. How many of us as a child practice asking somebody out for a prom? How many of us as a child practice asking our parents for something that you knew they were going to say no to? A lot of us. I mean, um, how many of us have practiced um, our tennis? Lots. Yeah. How many have practiced? See, we practice everything, you know. There's a reason why, you know, when, when Joe Montana gets in the two minute, last two minutes of a football game, and they go into the two minute drill or whatever it's called, and, and uh, he has practiced that, one, for real, and two, in his mind, millions of times. When people do in, uh, in athletic events, they're going to run the sprints or they're going to uh, do high jumping, they visualize, they see themselves going over it and accomplishing it time and again. 
But see, we make life too difficult. Business is no different. Practicing, and I call practice within, when, within, within yourself when you're without. I practice. I give the commencement speech, and it's in, in, it's in the back of the book here. Two years ago, where I went to school, I had practiced. I, I was comfortable because I had been there 15 years. I had been there 15 years. The first time I ever addressed a group of six or seven thousand, I was comfortable because I had practiced. The first time that I gave a sales presentation in the UK to convince people to give me $50 million for $60,000 worth of goods, I had practiced. Athletic teams practice. Why do athletic teams practice? Why, Jim, why do tennis pros practice? Well, every once in a while you're going to get in that situation where uh, you spend a lot of time practicing, but you're going to get in those tight situations every once in a while, and that's when all the hard work pays off. You know, there's, there's not that many times when it's going to you know, come down to the crucial element, but you've got you to get ready for it. They practice because then they're comfortable with it. Why don't you, as individuals, practice for those of you that don't, the crucial situations for your business. Now I know trial lawyers that practice. I mean they go to the extent of even having moot courts and stuff like that. Shadow juries in the audience. I mean why would you think being successful at business is any different? Everything I do well I practice. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a karate master in the audience, Master Stewart. And, I mean, I don't need to talk to him about practice. I mean, he understands probably better than anybody in the room. But we forget the things that worked for us as children, we don't do as adults. We just don't. It's just like why I talked about the alpha state being in the zone and why kids have, can learn easier things. They can learn foreign languages easier. They can do a lot of things easier because they don't have all these filters. They don't have all this conditioning. It's the same in business. I act as if I have no, I have no limits to my abilities. None. And when I was a kid, people called me a cocky, pompous, arrogant. And then as I had some success, and then lucky was added on. Okay. <laughs> lucky. And then, when I, when I, and then when I got into my early 30s, it was cocky, braggadocious, that I'd uh, still lucky. When I got into my 40s, and now I'm at my, I'll be, I'm going to be 48 in a few days, now I'm eccentric. I'm not lucky anymore. I'm not lucky anymore. I'm eccentric. And um, they certainly don't say that he was at the right place at the right time because they know that I rode oil from 40 to 10. So, I mean, they know that. But see, my attitudes have not changed. I've always, when I went back to give that speech, at Cal State Northridge, there were still some professors that were there when I was there, and they asked Dr. Shirley Teeter, who's one of the senior, uh, she's a, a dean, I believe, and he said, Dan has not changed 1% since the late 60s. Just in, in the late 60s, he hadn't done anything except flap his mouth, which was true, a lot, a lot of truth in that. But it's how you act. Girl mentioned Again, last night I keep pointing back to her, but uh, you acted differently when you went in and talked to these people, and their attitude changed, didn't it? And it's something different. It's it, it's 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 uh, it's contrary to how you have done your business and how you've been conditioned. When I was a successful stockbroker, and I was one of the big hitters in in the early '70s, I assumed. Now, a share, a, a share uh, order of a thousand shares in those days was a big deal. And they, my nickname was a thousand shares at the market. Because if you put a limits, then a lot of times you don't get the, the order off. And I just assumed, when I used to call on people, I didn't ask them whether they thought it was a good idea or not. I told them I had an opportunity. And I was only calling 25 people. And you're number six on my list. And I just assumed, when I sold real estate, I had a 94.6% closing rate ratio. When I sold real estate. The only way you left my office is if you died <laughs> without buying. You either went out on a stretcher or you bought.
the I, I, I acted as if I had no limits to my abilities and and, we're, and we, we tend to be cautious we tend to not trust our instincts we tend to not believe in ourselves enough we tend to come up with a, a myriad of reasons why it can't be done one of which is conventional wisdom one of which is your best friends your best friends most times in business are your worst enemies your best friends because unless and, and, and it's a sad thing to say about human nature but very few of your real friends will revel in your success and that enthusiasm most of the people you do business with and most of you in this room are not enthusiastic about what you do in business and I haven't even been there but I can tell and the reason I can tell is because most people aren't enthusiastic now enthusiasm is a word that comes from the Greek word God within I'm gonna give you a couple examples how many in the room have played um, college football high school football some of the guys okay now when you were playing sandlot football and we're playing touch or tackle and it's us three against those three and you come back and you tell me I can beat this guy in the flat this guy's a tub of shit or whatever I can beat him in the flat and the, the other guy but you're, you're just you're confident but you're not enthusiastic you come back jumping up and down hey god damn I can beat the dude throw me the ball now even though you may be a better athlete I got one one you know I'm probably gonna pick him up go down and cut in because he came across with enthusiasm not well well I think I got a 60% chance to 50 50 I could beat him in the flat maybe but it's raining and I could drop the ball and you know your arm hasn't been as good as it usually is Pena and uh, we've all got hangovers from last night cavorting around I mean and who are you gonna throw the ball to now you go into a banker now John Allen could take this part of the class you go into a banker enthusiastic about your product about your subdivision about whatever and enthusiasm is infectious instead of coming into the bank with your tail between your legs Donald I've got banks I'm owning money right now and I need it so bad and my husband's out of row oh, shit what am I gonna do <laughs> and who's gonna give you anything but most people come into bankers just like I described I'm ashamed to say most people come into your employer your superior with a project that you want like this oh, oh I know he's gonna say no I've spent nine months working up these numbers not I, I can tell you right now which you already know I, I never have gone into anybody that way I am surprised stunned shocked chagrined when somebody tells me no I can't believe it but I also know and you gotta know it's my fault if I can't convince auntie my boss of ABC it's not auntie's fault it's my fault I didn't do it right I go back to the drawing table and I regen it and I do it again and I keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it 17 times like we said earlier with enthusiasm what we are going to produce out of you in the audience because people follow the fellow that follows a dream you will find people more willing to do deals with you transactions more willing to go out with you more willing to marry you more willing to whatever you if they feel that you're you are a person that pursues your dream people come and listen to me talk because they know that I pursued my dream and that I've been successful at fulfilling my dream and as Napoleon Hill says a fearless man thrives on far horizons now it has also been said that if you will do the thing you fear well this is important if you would do the thing you fear death of fear is certain courage is not the absence of fear and anxiety it is proceeding in spite of those feelings and 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 if you haven't already got it most people don't succeed because they're afraid of success they're afraid of failure they're afraid of the things that are attributable to not succeeding again Napoleon Hill 
Does anybody remember reading or hearing how Napoleon Hill uh, got his first Rolls Royce or visualized his first Rolls Royce or how he set his goal for his first Rolls Royce? He was seven years old. He was dirt poor, I guess, in Tennessee, where he's from. And he was sitting in a crick when he used to feel lonely. He used to go down to this crick. Is that how they say crick? Crick. And he used to sit on this old log and he used to sit down there and cry because, you know, his, his, his mother had passed away and his dad wasn't doing well and it was, it was, it was poor times. And he sat in this, on this log in this crick and he said, someday I'm going to be rich and someday I'm going to have these things. And he says, and he, he used to close his eyes and visualize a Rolls Royce. And in that time, there were the old boxy big things that looked got like a truck. But he says he visualized it. Then... When he got into his, I guess, 40s, uh, and he had worked on this the project for Mr. Carnegie for 20 years, and he had written, uh, in fact, no, he had not published Think and Grow Rich yet. Um, pardon? Oh, he had, he had not published, uh, I, I believe, Think and Grow Rich. And he got his first Rolls Royce, and uh, it happened overnight. Some guy gave him a Rolls Royce, his first Rolls Royce, and he took that car, and he drove it back to Tennessee, he drove it down into that crypt. And he parked it right where he saw it when he was seven. 30, 35 years later. Now, he visualized that goal. And an important concept that I, I, I have to get across is that when these goals come to fruition, it's extremely important to put them in that same context that you first visualized it. He went back and he drove it there because that is validation of what he had desired. That is why when professional athletes, golfers, even when they hit a good shot, first of all they visualize the sh shot they're going to hit before, then they hit it, then they visualize it again and they relive those positive experiences. When you do things right, revel in it. No matter what your husband, wife, friends, parents, revel in it. Pat yourself on the back. Blow smoke up your you-know-what. <laughs> revel in it. Because one of the things I'm going to talk about later is glory is fleeting. And it's much easier to replicate successful occurrences if they're vivid in your mind. Revel in your success. Be they small or be they great. I mean, take the time. If when you do something right and you have a success, I mean, think about it. Some people say that, you know, talk about it. And if you've got nobody to talk to and nobody to listen to, talk about it in front of a mirror. Get used to it, is what I'm trying to say. Get used to being successful. Get used to being right. Get used to getting people to do what you want them to do. Get used to it. And the more you're used to it, the easier it becomes. Now, for those of you that are engineers, again, uh, I mean, this perfection equals paralysis. What we're going to talk about is doing it good enough. I was a detail-oriented person until I was 31 years old. I took more notes. By the way, I, I kept more records. I, I was successful by normal standards. I made quite a bit of money. Then I attended a seminar, which we'll talk about a little later, and I stopped being detail-oriented, and I took on the good enough. It's good enough. Since I adopted the good enough method is when I attained all my success, 95% um, of it anyway, and I built um, a successful, very large company. Most successful people do it poorly until they do it well. Just keep blundering. You cannot wait until the time's exactly right. We're going to talk about it's not being ready, it's being comfortable. You're never ready. Norman Schwarzkopf was not ready to lead men at des Desert Storm. Norman Schwarzkopf was comfortable with his ability to succeed. I was not ready to be a CEO of a large company. 
but I was comfortable with my abilities. You are not ready, for those of you that have uh, had children, which I, I have sympathy for, you're never ready to be a mother. You're not ready to have that thing, I mean, that, that come out of your body. I mean, you're not ready. You're just not. You're not ready when they make a cardinal a pope. You know, I mean, it's not a matter of being ready. It's a matter of being comfortable. And there's a big difference. And for those of you that get comfortable with it, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Because success leaves clues. And the one thing I do agree with that all the speakers, or mostly all the speakers, talk about is to pattern themselves after somebody that's been successful. Most of us, through life, pattern ourselves after our father, our mother, our older brother, And unless you're blessed with a super successful father, mother, older brother, or older sister, I'm afraid that I got bad news for you. You're going to wind up just like them. John Allen Chalk, many years ago, gave me some advice. This is, I think, before I had children. And he has very successful children. And, uh, and, uh, and I take my hat off to him. And maybe John will share some few things with us a little later. He said, damn. He says, I learned a long time ago, he says, I wonder, if I want my children to, 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 to grow up this way, I have to put them in that environment. And that's what he did. If you want to be successful in life, in business, you have to put yourself in that environment. This is that environment. I'm one of those kind of people. I will stay here tonight and answer questions till the wee hours. I talk to the participants. Just as I converse with Casey, he faxed me at the castle. I do that. Some of the motivational gurus that I know that I consult with and talk with, they say, Dan, that's a bad precedent to set, talking to all those people. He says, you won't have time to do that. I said, why not? He says, Dan, I mean, the thousands, I mean, and that's how they think, unfortunately. I will not have a, have a masseur or a metaphysical psychic here like some of these guys do. And I won't tell you I have a migraine and I, I just not with it today. Uh, I, I would be up here, unless I drop dead from a heart attack today, I will be just as motivated tonight when we end as I am now. Because I owe you that. And that's about being comfortable. Mm -hmm. I can understand not being ready because I can think back to all the things I've done. I don't think I was ever ready. But being comfortable with quantum growth, what did you do? How did you know you were comfortable when you were starting when you were undertaking quantum growth steps? Like with the fifty million dollar deal in the UK. When did you know you were comfortable? All through my career, um, most of the time people told me and through my childhood, which we're gonna talk about a little later you can't do that, then you're basically worthless. And um, the, um, For a while, I think I probably didn't believe that. Not too long, but I think I did at a time for a time. And what I tried to do, and I think I was very successful, is that, I, and we're going to talk about the mentor mastermind theory and how I don't think the mastermind theory is so good, and I think the mentor system is better. I tried to, wherever I could, associate, be around, uh, even on a, in, in a peripheral manner, around very successful people. Uh, I wasn't much for reading. I read 200, I read 200 words a minute. I mean, it's, I'm, I didn't read, to, I, this is a, a hard thing to say, but I've only read until recently three books in my whole life, and one of those books I read twice. I read The, the Life and Legend of Che Quivera twice. <laughs> this is a, even a, a more awful thing to say. I read Candy once. <laughs> so that was the extent of my literary background <laughs> growing up. And, uh, but I went places to see people that were successful. Um, and they didn't always want to see me, believe me. But I made it my business to be around them so I could be comfortable. Um, when I bought things ahead of the curve, I had a brand new Mercedes Benz. Well, no, I had a Rolls Royce when I was 25. 
I mean, I still remember Linda and I driving in my silver cloud, this is a long time ago, and taking it to a 49 cent car wash, drinking beer in the front seat, and, 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 and Linda wearing cut off jeans with pigtails, Linda looked about 12 at the time, and, uh, and, 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 and then I still remember them breaking the antenna off, and I still remember getting irritated with them, and, uh, but I, and then Linda says, well, Dan, we went to a 49 cent car wash. Maybe we, maybe we should have taken one of those places they hand wash it. Uh, but I've always been ahead of the curve. I bought, and when we get in the goal setting, I, 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 I thought about uh, owning a castle before. I owned one. In fact, one of the things that I will suggest, and I'll show you and I'll pass it out later, is that I used to read the Rob Report in the late 70s. And this is a, a, a magazine that's got only a subscription uh, uh, of about... 18,000 people or something, but the average net worth of the people that subscribe to this magazine is $4.5 million. The average net worth, the prospecting tool, the average net worth of the people that read Forbes, does anybody know? 207,000. Fortune, Forbes, all those are between 170 and 260,000. 4.5 million. I happen to know um, Maury Povich and Connie Chung read this. I happen to know a lot of very successful people read this. And I have, before I had any money, I was reading it and I was, you know, looking at Rolls Royces and Rolexes and, and things like this. And this issue, the reason that you can look at it during the break, is because this is where rich people, the people that subscribe to this magazine, pick the very best from cars, restaurants, investment bankers, books to read, country clubs, vacation spots. I used to go to vacation spots that I, you know, where successful people would be. Way before I was successful. I remember being at La Quinta. Linda and I, let's see, I was 26. Linda was 21, 22. We went to La Quinta to stay to play golf. And I remember sitting in the bar, in the men's uh, grill, and they came to me and the bartender said, excuse me, is there a Mr. Pena, Mr. Pena, Mr. And I said, yes, yes. They said, uh, he's whispering, says, there's a woman that purports to be your wife. Um, at the front gate, at the, um, in the lobby. I said, well, what do you mean purports? And she says, yes, because Linda had pigtails. She looked about 15 at the time. And, and they weren't going to, they, they didn't, they were afraid of some kind of scandal. I said, well, she's got pigtails, she's blonde, she's got blue eyes. I think that that woman that purports to be my wife is my wife. He says, oh, so she comes in, you know, and it was a bit, and, but we were staying at La Quinta. She comes in and the men's grill, and I mean, and, and everybody looks at her, and everybody still probably thought she was my daughter. But the, the point is, we were staying at La Quinta, and I was playing golf with guys that were 60 and 70 years old, that had been members there 30 years, and played with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. I used to caddy. Uh, I caddy for Bob Hope when I was a kid. Uh, I used to caddy, uh, the regular person I caddy for was Alice Marble. A lot of you are too young to remember Alice Marble, was U.S. Open. A tennis champion and uh, I used to like catting for her uh, because she used to tell me about Wimbledon things like that unfortunately it didn't roll over onto my tennis <laughs> yeah but the um, I used to do those things and I suggest my children do those things um, there's a fine line though with raising kids which I'm no great expert at but I mean there's a fine line because now my kids think everybody lives in a castle everybody's had chauffeurs and my, my daughter I think she's gonna, well, she's going to get married at the castle and she's going to have a 100-foot train. That's the thing. You walk a 100-foot train walking up to the wall garden and she expects a cardinal to marry her. She, when she said the Pope, I said, I'm not sure I can arrange that, the Pope. I don't know if the Pope marries anybody. But you put yourself, just as John Allen Chalk said about raising children, you put them in that environment, you put yourself in that environment. And it's always when you can't afford it. I couldn't afford La Quinta, but I, I was there and I got used to it. One of the reasons my wife and I are still married, because we've grown together, is because Linda thought this was a great idea. I mean, and, and, and we've accepted these challenges. My kids, you know, I can, my kid could fly from London to Los Angeles by himself today. My two sons, 10 and 11. I mean, they, we don't have to go get the, you know, pay $25 to have the flight attendant walk them from here to there. 
because they feel comfortable because they've been exposed to those things so what I did because we're going to talk about where I live in the graffiti you're going to see some pictures here in a few minutes I put myself in that position so I felt comfortable <laughs>